No Knows Knows Written by Irrespective Chapter 16 Check this out. Luna, Princess of the Moon and Stars, grumbled to herself as she forced her hooves down the hallway and towards the kitchen. Those cutie mark crusaders were going to be the end of her, but she did have to give them points for originality. Somehow, those adorably destructive fillies had given all the Ponyville a nightmare about marshmallows stacked into a bipedal form, dressed up in a sailor's uniform, and throwing rubber tires at every pony. The word vexing was being used quite a bit as her fatigued brain contemplated this. Luna decided that the how and why didn't really matter. What did matter was a quick bite to eat to calm her stomach, and then sleep. Dealing with the Tantibus wouldn't be nearly so vexing. It was a strange word if one really thought about it. The dining room doors were sticking again, so Luna opted for the direct approach of simply forcing her way inside. She mustered enormous amounts of willpower to bridge the vast gap between her and a basket of fruit, and without looking, she selected one from the pile and bit into it. Pineapple. A worthy fruit foe, but its reinforced hide was helpless before Luna's sheer jaw power and sparkling white enamel. Plus, it got the lingering taste of burnt marshmallow out of her mouth. She then looked up, and she let out a startled gasp. Bean, are you all right? The new prince looked absolutely horrible. His coat was matted in places, and his mane looked like it had tried to eat a lightning bolt. But the most concerning thing was his eyes. They were bloodshot, sunken and hollow, focusing on nothing but an invisible abyss of horror. He didn't acknowledge her in any form, but Luna was fairly certain about what happened to Baked Bean. Celestia snores, she offered. Bean slowly nodded. Celestia snores. He paused and swallowed hard. Loudly. Ah, a dose for reality for the newlywed. <laughs> Luna chuckled. You shall get used to it in overtime. Do not worry. You do? He asked, with a bit more dispersion in his voice than he intended. Of course. It only took Starstruck about 15 years to get used to my snoring. Luna considered her memories with a smile. Years? He whimpered. Yes, certainly you can hold out that long, correct? You snore too? Megbean wasn't quite all there this morning, it seemed. All alicorns do, even if they deny it. I think it has something to do with the wing and horn combination personally. Bean nodded slowly. Hall, Alicorn, Snore. A little like a tuba in a bagpipe quartet, admitted Bean. Bean? Cecily called while she entered the room. Are you in here? Yes and no, called out Luna in return. It was intriguing to see Celestia wandering the castle without her regalia on. Usually her silly sister would sleep in it, though that always had seemed rather uncomfortable to the Lunar Diarch. Are you alright, Bean? So Steve followed up as she trotted over to where he was. Yeah, uh, I think I'm okay. I just didn't sleep well. Oh dear. So Steve gasped a bit as she reached over and booped him. Another nightmare? Uh, no, not that. You, well, you, um... She put a hoof to her mouth. I was snoring, wasn't I? Loudly, Luna added. Oh my... This hasn't been a problem before, Lulu. Wasn't there a spell you used to stop your snoring? Yes, but I don't recall how it went. I'm sure a little searching in the archives will turn it up. Fifteen years? Bean asked Luna with an annoyed glare. Luna shrugged. Yes, minutes. It all blends together after long enough. Your mane is a mess, Susty stated at the obvious, as she moved to be directly behind him. Hold still. What are you... Uh, uh. Bean started to ask, but then when his eyes rolled back to his head, and he sighed in happiness as Celestia began nipping and tugging at his mane with her teeth. Luna simply rolled her eyes at the display and took another large bite of the pineapple, relishing her victory over the rugged fruit. There, Celestia announced after a minute or so. Not the best, but it looks better than what it did. Bean did look better, and his eyes were back to normal when he opened them, and he turned to look at his wife. Thank you. That was just what I needed. She smiled and booped him again. You're welcome. I'll make sure to find that anti-storing spell, too. 
<laughs> I hope so. He chuckled. Luna, would you care to have breakfast with us? I will have to decline your fair offer today, sister. I'm in need of rest more than breakfast at the moment. Oh. Sustia flatly replied. Well, perhaps tomorrow? Perhaps. Good day to you both. And with that, Luna departed with the remains of her pineapple. I'd rather hope she would stay. I always enjoy having breakfast with her. Thus he remarked as she sat down next to Bean. Well, she did look pretty rough. There were probably a lot of nightmares last night. That could be. If so, I hope she gets the rest she deserves. Sister replied thoughtfully. In any case, the day is young and there is much to be accomplished. Are you still planning on touring Cantalot with your family? Yeah, so I should probably go talk to them and get that worked out. I never did introduce you to your assigned guards, did I? Not yet. As soon as we finish breakfast, we will do so. Sergeant Hokey Pokey and Cloverleaf will be happy to serve and protect you. I guess you won't be able to go out with me and the family for the tour, huh? I do wish I could, but I am still far behind in my work. Thankfully, I think two days of focused effort should get things caught up. I also have my class to teach today. That's right, I forgot about that. Do you have any toilet level students you're working with? Celestia laughed. <laughs> no, but that's actually making my life easier. Twilight was a joy to teach, but she was so brilliant and so advanced that I struggled to keep ahead of her in certain areas of study. There are times I think she taught me just as much as I taught her. That makes sense. Now then, I would like to have breakfast with your family and our niece and nephew. Why don't we go get cleaned up? Bean then ran his hooves through his mane a few times. Okay, I'm good. Oh, no, no, no. If you're going to be a proper prince, you must at least use a comb. She can't believe Bean's suddenly awake expression with the mischievous sense of humor that he seemed to enjoy so much. Perhaps even... a brush. She added with a low, husky voice. Not the brush! exclaimed Bean before pomping to his hooves and making a run for the hallway. No! He called out as he ran. Help! I'm too ruggedly handsome to be brushed! Sustia laughed out loud while taking off after him. <laughs> brushy, brushy! She called out, laughing even harder as he galloped through the hallways. Big Bean smiled to himself while he finished chewing his bite of breakfast. Chef Bean had provided a most pleasant breakfast of biscuits and rutabata gravy for him and his family, and the conversations that floated between his parents and their employees centered mostly on how to replicate the dish. He had felt a twinge of sadness when Celestia had excused herself to go attend her duties, when breakfast ran no longer than expected, but he also knew that it could not be helped. Since his family had left home in a panic without even properly closing the Zerst, he understood why they needed to go back soon. That did not mean he liked it, an opinion shared by Sip, Shake, and Bake. Grumps was true to his namesake and just grumbled about everything in general, but Bean knew the grizzled old cook never liked being far from home, even if his employer's son was now his prince. Eventually, every pony sailed on, touring the palace and the grounds, heading to the flower patch where Bean had met his wife, and then catching an afternoon train home. Cadence and Shining agreed to go with the Bean Horde on the tour, and Shining left slightly early to check on their security detail. A few minutes later, Shining reappeared and waved Bean out into the hallway. Bean! This is Sergeant Hokey Pokey and Sergeant Cloverleaf. He bore to each in turn, and they saluted as he did so. These two will be with you any time you go outside the palace. They both have exceptional marks and several commendations, and they've honored to be your security. Are you really? He asked Hokey Pokey. Yes, sir. No higher honor than the guard the bean who is having an existential crisis, sir. <laughs> oh, so who was you in the hallway that day? It was, sir. And you, Cloverleaf? Pleasure to be attached to you, sir. Came a surprisingly female voice. You're a mare? I am. Clover turned to Hokey Pokey and gave him an accusatory look. Why didn't you tell me, Hokey? I wasn't totally sure myself, he replied. I've lost track how many stallions you've drunk under the table. The royal guard is about an even to male and female ratio, Shanny explained while Clover preened with pride. Would you like to know how I tell the difference? That would be nice. It's all in the ears, Shanny said conspiratorially. Male ears are slightly more pointed than females. They are? He asked as he looked closely at Hokey's ears. I don't see it. Right at the tip, sir. 
Pokey offered, turning one ear in his direction. What? Right there? I don't see it. You're not messing with me, right? Shining is being serious, Cadence answered as she and everybody else came into the hallway. You'll get it. Don't worry. You'll forgive me if I get you two mixed up, Bean asked the guards. No problem at all, sir, Clover replied with a quick laugh. We get it all the time. Well, shall we? Cadence asked as she gestured a hoof down the hallway. And this is it, the sunflower patch of destiny. There was a bit of silence for a moment as every pony contemplated the fateful spot, and then Sip piped up with a question. Dude, did you really not see the sign in fence? Those weren't there when I was here. Bean looked at the new, please stay on the path, signs and short iron fence. I wouldn't have shoved myself in there otherwise. Well, I can see how the princess didn't see you. Garbanzo stayed as he took a step closer to the patch. These are pretty thick. You were just standing next to them, you say? Not exactly. I was standing all the way in them, with my nose up to try to catch a muse. Bean let out a snort of amusement. <laughs> I guess I did. If I hadn't been doing that, Celestia would have missed. Well, you could have missed anyway, or bumped into your butt, Sip pointed out. Just a few inches in any direction, she wouldn't have got you. That was quite a lucky shot, Bean Minister. I didn't think of that. Bean rubbed his nose. <laughs> That's kind of funny. It's all history now, right? Garbanzo added. There's nothing else to do but move forward. Very true. Baked dear. Could you show us the statues? Lima asked. I've heard quite a bit about the one bird bath from Needlepoint, and I would like to see what all the fuss is about. Yeah, they're just over there, if I remember right. Bean motioned down a path. Shouldn't be too hard to find. The entourage began moving again, except for Garbanzo. He remained stationary, peering into the sunflowers as if he was expecting something to jump out of them. Bean noticed he hadn't moved after taking a few steps, and he moved back as Kitten slid the group onward and began taking about their bird bath in question. Dad? You okay? Hmm? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. His father lifted his head and took a long, deep breath of the garden's fresh air. <sighs> Just lost in thought, Bean, buddy. Want to talk about it? I don't know where to begin. Garbanzo sighed. I'm just trying to get my head around all this. My son leaves home, comes to Cantalot, and ends up marrying a princess. It's plot to the world's dumbest story, and yet it's real. Oh, no offense. None taken. It's a pretty wild tale. I just... He stalled. I guess I was wrong about things. And it's hard to swallow. Wrong? I thought for sure this writing thing was just a phase, a moment of questioning. Even when, when you were a teeny tiny bean, I was sure you were going to be a chef, just like all the beans have been. I had grand plans for you, grand plans. They were going to take the Zerst farther than I could ever dream of with your skills. I agonized over the lessons we gave you when you were a cult, debated and triple-guessed myself. Would this really be useful for my bean bunny to learn? Would it make him the most respected name in the cooking that ever was? Could he? There's a long and thoughtful pause. Would he carry on the family dream for me? Garbanzo said softly. It hurts to think that all that time, all that effort, and I was pushing you in the wrong direction. I was so sure of your destiny that I totally missed it. It sounds selfish, but now all my dreams have been defeated too. I wanted... Ah, me. I. Mine. That's where I went wrong. Me, me, me. I didn't pay attention to you. I was so set in having you share the dream that I squashed yours. You gave me the warning signs you tried to tell me. You should have realized it was the end when you went running with those tofu blocks in your ears. No. I had to keep pushing. Keep forcing. So long as I was getting what I wanted, who cared what else happened? My bean buddy would come around. I just had to be right. There was no way I could be wrong. I was so in denial that I even refused to believe a princess was in front of me. It was just all an act. He'd come around. Bean put his arm over his father's withers and he stared into the flower patch with him. Look, I don't know what to say about your dreams. 
In all those years, the one thing that hurt me the most was that I was letting you down. I really did want to be that great chef that you envisioned. I actually kind of hoped that once I got established as a writer, I could write a cookbook and put all the family recipes in it. Share it with the world. But I know one thing, Dad. Above all else, you did good with me. Maybe some of your efforts were misguided, but overall you were and still are a fantastic father. You taught me things that have been more help than I have probably ever even realized, and that training didn't go to waste. I've already used some of your wisdom and your lessons, and I'm sure I'll be using it a lot more as time goes on. The only way I'll be able to hack it as a prince is because you taught me fundamental skills to use. Maybe I won't be a world-renowned chef, but I know that when people look back at the odd reign of Prince Baked Bean, they'll see a strong family behind him, a father and a mother who really did care and looked after him. Garbanton turned a little and gave his son a soft smile. Thanks, son. Dreams don't always need to die, Dad. Sometimes they just need a little adjustment. <laughs> Garbanzo chuckled. I guess so. You're going to be a household name one way or another. <laughs> don't remind me. Bean said while suppressing a snort of laughter. We should catch up to your mother before she starts to worry. She already is, I bet. They both chuckled at this. <laughs> yeah, you do realize she's going to keep pestering you for grandfuls until you actually provide one, right? I said, don't remind me. Bean laughed. One bridge at a time. Celestine so paused for a quick moment to ensure that she had written everything she needed on the classroom chalkboard, and then she turned back to her students. All right, every pony. I trust you all have a petri dish ready? Yes, princess. Celestia's class groaned. Good. Now I want you all to take a cotton swab and... Princess? A little filly interrupted. Yes, Wintergreen? You look different today. I do? Celestia asked and she glanced back at her tail, while surreptitiously checking her teeth for leftovers from breakfast with her tongue. I don't recall changing anything in my appearance. Yeah, you look like you're brighter. <laughs> brighter? She giggled. You know I don't produce light, right? I know, but you do. You look brighter and happier, too. Your smile looks nicer than it usually does. A call in the back then piped up. That's because Princess Celestia has a special sun pony, and they got married and everything. That is true, but I think you would have to find a better way to make that statement, Granite. There was a sudden explosion of questions from the young and eager learners, but Celestia had no chance at hearing them all. She didn't manage to hear. I heard you've been kissing in the hallways. I heard Prince Bean stole your tiara, and you had to chase him down and get it back. And? Did you really plant him in the ground and then harvest him? <laughs> My dear little ponies. So Steele laughed. Where in Equestria do you come up with these questions? Did you really get married, princess? Well, yes, Wintergreen, I did. She replied with a warm smile. I wrote a law many, many years ago that made me get married, but it took a long time for me to find someone who was it meant for. Do you love Prince Bean? Granite asked. My mom said you married him because you had to, and that you're going to kick him out of the palace once you figure out how to get rid of him. Granite, tell your mother that your teacher, Princess Celestia, unequivocally loves Prince Bean. To the best of my knowledge, he's not going anywhere. He plans on staying, and I plan on keeping him. Does he love you? Granite replied. He does, but he's a bit shy about it. She replied. Sometimes a special sunpony needs a little extra time, and that's okay. He isn't used to Cantalot or being a royal. He's also still getting used to me. Getting used to you? Another filly asked. Yes, Marble. He doesn't know me as well as you all do. He still has a lot to learn, and I have a lot to learn about him. So Sidon had a delightful thought into her head and she gave her students a sly smile. But if I make you this offer, if you all do well in this week's test, I will have him come visit. Then you can ask him all the questions you want. Does that sound fair? Yeah! The class interrupted. Good. Now before our bacteria goes bad, let's get back to the lesson. Everyone get a cotton swab. Bean took a moment to glance at the train that was waiting on the track 29, and he signed while turning back to his family and friends. Well... This is it, I suppose. Thanks for the summer tip, Bean Mister. We'll do this again sometime.
said Bonford and they hoofed bump quickly. Don't be a stranger, eh? I need to dream of it. Sip smiled and then stepped aside for Grumps. I'm telling you that princess of yours is practicing some strange voodoo. You keep an eye on her for me, all right? I can do that, Grumps. You take care of yourself. Don't get too happy. You have a reputation to uphold. <sighs> Don't worry about that, Prince. He retorted with a small smile. Shake and Bake were next, and the twins looked rather sad. Do you think you can get us her autograph? Shake asked. I think I can. Yours too? Baked asked. Well, if you think it's worth something. It will be. You take care of yourself, all right? I will. You keep your brother in line in exchange. No promises there. All three laughed and they moved aside to let Garbanzo and Lima have their moment. I wish you could come with us, Lima sadly remarked. But I understand why you can't. You'll brush your teeth, right? I don't think Sally will let me forget. And I still want Grandfalls. Don't wait too long on that. I'll see what I can do. You should make her some of your grandma's fudge. I bet she'd really like that. Or maybe that sponge cake or a nice rhubarb pie or... Mom, you're rambling. I know. She put a tender hoof on his cheek and sighed. My little pink grew up too fast. And then when he went and turned into a prince... Oh, I'm going to miss you, honey. You're welcome to visit any time, and Sally and I will drop on on occasion, I'm sure. This isn't the end. It's just a change. And it's for the best, she replied as they hugged. Just be safe, okay? I don't want you getting hurt by some villain like Discord. Funny you should mention him. You remember when the ceiling laughed and made a joke about one big bean pun? That was him? She asked and be nodded. Will you tell him to behave or you'll have to deal with me? I will. Between you and Fluttershy, who'd be too scared to misbehave. Good. Right often, will you? I want to hear all about what you're doing. I will. Lima then fought back tears as she let Garbanzo in. The father and son hugged quickly, and then Garbanzo sighed. <sighs> I always thought I'd have to tell you to treat your special somebody like a princess. But I guess that point's mute. It's still good advice. It almost is for you. I think it's more appropriate to say to make sure you treat her like she's your wife. How could I not? Because she's the princess. So she doesn't need another worshipper. She's got a whole country of those. What she needs is a companion. A helper. She needs someone to be her friend. She probably hasn't had many of those. Treat her as an equal, and you'll be alright. Be nodded thoughtfully. Thanks. I'll try to. No other than lead it a bit. Also try running between her wings, because I love that. Okay. And if you're really trying to turn her on, just... G Dad! Bean shouted. What? I want Grandfalls too. I am not hearing this. I'm not. Bean covered his ears with his hooves for a moment, but then he laughed with the group. Garbanzo then nodded firmly. You'll do good. You're a good bean. Just like the beans before me. Sergeant Cloverleaf then cleared her throat. <clears throat> Excuse me, sirs, but we need to have you leave now in order to catch your train. I hate goodbye. Garbanzo and Lima hugged Bean together. So we'll see you around instead, all right? We will. Have a safe trip, Duke and Duchess Bean. Duchess, Lima repeated as they broke apart. Sounds like something that would have a cream of mushroom in it. They all chuckled at this, and then a final round of goodbyes was shared by everyone. Bean then suddenly watched as Sergeant Leaf escorted his friends and family away but he made sure to wave as they left. He then let out his breath slowly. It was only one in the afternoon, so Celestia would still be busy doing whatever it was that she was doing. Shani and Cadence had left the group a short while ago to meet a trade minister, so he was on his own until dinner. He played with the crystal around his neck for a moment while he thought about what to do. He probably wasn't needed anywhere, but he could probably go do more research for his story. He did have to admit he was eager to get some of his ideas down, and then to see what Sally thought of them. He hoped she liked them. And with that resolute thought, he started off for the archives. He's just over there, your highness. Thank you. Sustius stealthily crept up Nabeen. He was totally engrossed in writing, and he had several books scattered around him under the table. Though she was curious as to what he was doing, she was going to have a little fun first. Her approach went unnoticed, and she smiled and she softly blew into his right ear, inflicting irritation, but he didn't react otherwise. 
She blew on his left ear next, and for a bit longer. This time he reached up and scratched, but still he kept writing. She then nipped his ear. He gasped lightly, but then smiled broadly when he turned and found her there. I am ever glad that you're the one who did that, he remarked. I was going to have a panic attack for a moment there. I suppose that's a good thing. Did your parents leave already? Yeah, they needed to get back to check on the restaurant. They left just after lunch. Oh, she pouted. I was hoping to say goodbye as well. I guess we'll have to go visit them again sometime soon. I'm sure they love that. What's all this? Research. I'm trying to get my story started. Really? She said with some excitement and he nodded. Do you have enough to share yet? I would like to see what you've got. I don't really have a plot yet. Most of this is facts and details of the world, in the general outline. You're welcome to read what I've got so far, though. Suste so quickly and eagerly moved to the other side of the library table, and smiled deeply as Bean handed her his notebook. It appeared he had started a new one, and he already had a dozen or so pages filled in. Let me see. No title yet, but that's fine. I honestly think a title should wait until you finish the story. Ah, premise. A unicorn with extraordinary power managed to open a hole in the universe... During a science experiment and through it, he discovers a new world. Once there, he finds a strange group of bipedal creatures who have something like claws instead of forehooves and flattened faces. Kind of like a monkey's. I'm going to deduct five points for using Kinda. <laughs> it's a rough draft, he defended. Hmm. The unicorn, Calm Breeze, finds himself inexplicably attracted to the females of this world, especially the ones who are virtuous and honest, forthright and pure. Using his magic, he makes it his mission to help these creatures resolve various dilemmas and difficulties. It ain't going to be... Ah, you little sneak. Bean tried to keep his chortling in, but he failed miserably at it. So she tried to give him a sour look, but it was obvious she was amused at the joke too. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to. He managed to say after a moment. The opportunity was there, I had to take it. Oh, really? She flatly replied. Minus a million points for that one. I should have seen that coming. I'll take that part out. But what do you think? Hmm. An interesting concept. Would Calm Breeze be able to enter and leave his world at will? I'm thinking that some of the magic portal opens when he's needed there. And he remains a unicorn while there. His form doesn't change them at the creatures around him. No, he stays the same. I think that will be one of the challenges he faces. He's so different than anything they have on that world that the antagonists want to capture him. He wants to help, but he has to stay safe. Does the portal open in midair, or is it tied to something like a doorway, or... She hesitated only slightly. Or a mirror? A mirror, huh? I think it just appears. Seems a bit cumbersome to have to go through a mirror every time. Interesting. Why don't we go and get something to eat and we'll keep going over this? That sounds good. He replied and they both stood. But watch your tense. If you start it in the past tense, you need to keep it that way. You flipped it to a present tense right here. Oh, okay. He erased the offending words, then tried again through a yawn. Sussie watched him working on her wing and she smiled. He had attacked this project with enthusiasm and had directed out most of the first chapter already. It was already an ambitious story, but he had the momentum to complete it, provided he received support and encouragement. She was more than happy to bride both. But then she frowned. He had stopped riding and was chewing on his pencil, and that made the hairs of her neck stand on end. Stop that. Huh? Stop what? You are chewing on your pencil. I am? He asked as he chewed on it and thought. Yes, you're doing it right now. Look at the poor thing. Her magic quickly snagged the helpless instrument of riding away, and she held it in front of Bean. Oh, I didn't even realize it. It's a very bad habit. I don't tolerate with my students, and I certainly won't let you do it. What's so bad about it? The wood can splinter and injure your mouth for one thing, and the graphite isn't healthy for you for a second thing. Just those two things? It's gross. She finished with her nose in the air slightly. Ha! <laughs> Bean knows the wing draped over his shoulder. I seem to remember some pony telling me how she spit all over her feathers. That's different! protested Celestia. I don't chew on them. He smiled from his comfortable spot beneath her warm wings. Right, he said with a yawn. Totally different. It is. She continued looking at his mangled pencil. 
I bring to keep my feathers neat, presentable, and airworthy. I don't just idly chew on them when I'm thinking. Chewing on pencils serves no purpose. You don't write any better, it's bad for your teeth and gums, and don't even get me started on how bad the dyes in the outer shell are for you. If you must chew on something, then you think you should use a piece of gum. That way you can fight cavities and have fresh breath. Doesn't that make sense? Having made her point with the most perfect of arguments, Cecily looked down at Bean. He was sleeping beneath her spit-covered wings. She could not even be irritated because of how happy he looked, and at the same time, the look lit a fire of joy in her chest. This isn't over. She threatened as her magic levitated the pencil and notebook to be tucked away for later. Although after a moment's thought, she put the splintered pencil in the trash and conjured him a new one. I'll be waiting for you. She kissed him on the nose. You sneak. Says then casually snagged the dragonfire scroll that popped in and out of nowhere and opened it. Though it was a bit strange for Twilight to take so long to reply to one of her letters, since he was reasonably sure that her protege had been engaged in other endeavors and had simply forgotten to write. Dear Princess Celestia, It's me, Spike. Twilight has been busy helping every pony in town get ready for Prince Bean's visit tomorrow, so she totally forgot to reply to your letter. Celestia smirked as she envisioned Spike secretly writing that admittance, even though Twilight had probably asked him not to. She says tomorrow is fine and that he may come whenever he's ready, but she also respectively asked you to give her arrival time. From what I've heard around town and from what I've seen, Prince Bean should be very welcome when he gets here. Anyway, have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow. So Steve felt the glow fill her entire chest with this news. The trip to Bonyville would be a wonderful and early self-esteem boost for her being. And if something horrible should happen to her, he knew he would call on to help. And if it was Pinkie Pie's last new prince in a questious party was any indication, Bean had righteously fun event ahead of him. She then simply placed a scroll on the table and yawned. She could understand why Bean had fallen asleep, because it had just been such a long day for her too. Just as she began to settle next to her beloved Bean though, she remembered something rather important. Her horn flared and produced a golden orb in front of her that was about the size of a golf ball. With no joy whatsoever, she then ate said ball. A disgusted face from the bitter taste of it immediately followed, and she quickly levitated a nearby glass of water to herself. The things I do for love, she muttered after draining the glass. Though I suppose one little antique storing spell isn't too much to ask. We should both sleep well tonight. She then sighed happily as she laid her head back down next to Bean. He grunted a bit and shuffled a little, but then he gave a matching sigh of contentment as well. Good night, my Bean, she whispered. Sleep well. And with that final happy thought, the prince and princess drifted into deep and snore-free slumber together. There we go. Another fantastic chapter oh, and positively adorable. That's so cute. I can't wait to see how Bean reacts with the whole class and all of that fun stuff. That aside, however, I would like to thank my wonderful Patreons. Thank you my tier 1 Patreons Squall Windfeather, Rain Flicker, Starlight Blaze, Stu Hex, and Dreamless Portal. My tier 2 Patreons Chase the Master, Sword Brother and Mordred, Solus, R.D. Bryant, Captain Blue Shadow, HKH4 aka Texture, and The Animated Ghost. And thank you for joining my tier 2 patronage, Nocturne 2, or just Nocti. I appreciate so much man, thank you, thanks a ton man, for your support, it means a lot to me. And also a large thank you to Silent Titan. Thank you guys so much, it means a ton to me, I already said that, no matter, I'm the funny word man, I can say what I want. Uh, should I bloop it? Nah, we're keeping this in. We're keeping this in. <laughs> that aside, however, I hope you guys have enjoyed. This has been Firehearth. Have a wonderful day.